All right, well, let's get started here. Let me share my screen. Okay. And we'll get to... So today we're talking about, it's, it's another continuation of our backyard birding class. Um, thank you everyone for, for coming out today for our active adult class here. And we had talked about last time, kind of in, introduced you guys to some of the native plants and um, you know ideal birds you'll want to target whenever you're here in, uh, in Texas. And today we're gonna to be talking all about your wildlife plan. So this should be, if you are looking to create a backyard paradise or if you already have one and you're looking to expand on it, I highly recommend that you start with a wildlife plan. I just, I called it a wildlife plan. Maybe people call it a backyard a birding design, a garden design. It, it's, it's all the same. It's, it's a plan that you set in motion to keep you on track as you go to make your backyard paradise. We are in, you know, in Texas, we have, we're, we're in the benefit of having a pretty suitable environment for a number of birds. Um, you know, we have a lot of migratory birds, uh, larger predators, waterfowl, um, and songbirds. And the number of songbirds that we have are hundreds, um, in, in our area. So you have a di diverse array and that's not even including all the insects. If you wanted to track squirrels or, or uh, mice or anything like that, you know, that's not including all the diverse array of wildlife that you can bring into your, into your back backyard. Um, but we're going to kind of, we're going to break it down. And when you make your wildlife plan, the, the elements you want to make sure that you are including in your backyard paradise are going to be food sources, water sources, a cover for wildlife, a place to raise their young, and using sustainable practices while you are building your plan. Now, we I took these elements from the National Wildlife Federation Certified Wildlife Habitat. So if you, as I go through this presentation, if you are interested in, in building a backyard paradise and you want to take it a step further and get a little plaque that you can put in your backyard to say that you are a certified wildlife habitat, as long as you follow these four or these five elements, then you can go online after it's all done and you can su submit for your own certification. You get this nice little plaque. In fact, if I can um, go back here, we can po probably show you, oops, show you what it looks like. Here, click on this, and this is what it looks like. This little uh, raccoon in a ranger's hat, beautiful. And this is something you can put in your backyard. So when your friends come over, you can you can you know kind of educate them on on ways that you are helping wildlife continue to prosper in our rural suburbia kind of environment. Because as you know, you guys are aware, as we humans make more of an impact on land and in, in our in our space, most often we are pushing out wildlife, we are taking away their habitat from them, and we can kind of just get back a little bit by creating another habitat in our backyard. So feel free to um, to ask me any questions throughout the presentation. Um, Today's presentation, I'm really not going to talk a lot about specifics of birds, insects, and stuff like that. It's focusing a lot on the wildlife plan, but I am going to give you a lot of resources that will, that will help you when you are doing your research. Um, so we're going to continue on, and I just realized now that I'm not presenting. And that should look a lot better. All right. So just to go back and, and show you guys, the elements that we have were food sources, water sources, cover for wildlife, place to raise your young, and sustainable practices. Okay. And so when you start out, the first thing you want to do before you start deciding what you want to make, plant in your backyard is you're going to decide what do you want to attract? Do you want to attract birds or insects? Do you want to attract squirrels? Um, hopefully probably not rats or mice, but you never know. Um, 
do you want to if you're out in the in the hill country do you want to attract deer does your do you have like a fenced backyard where you could attract larger wildlife um there's lots of wildlife that you could attract in texas and a lot of it is really you know it's 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 nice to to look at um i have a friend on facebook that has started setting up their backyard for possums um and then they've they really do they love possums they had last year a whole possum uh, litter was born in their backyard and they got to you know and, and live through that so um you know don't think of it as we are a backyard birding class that you have to be focusing on birding but a lot of what we're talking about will be reflected on birding so you can search and and i have the link here but you can go to the travis audubon if you just search kind of texas backyard birds or um, native birds you can find in texas and go by the texas the travis county audubon um web page um, there is a Williamson County Audubon group, but I, they didn't just didn't have as good of a, um, of a resource as the Travis County one did. And then you can also find uh, information on bu butterflies and other insects that we have here in Texas at the Texas insects um, section of the Texas A&M Extension Service. Um, so it's just Texas insects at tamu.edu. So, I mean, there are lots of butterflies, but if you, I mean, if you wanted to attract moths, I mean, there's lots of, there's a huge diverse amount of, of insects that you can attract. And a lot of them, when you're attracting birds, you need to attract these insects, both as a food source and as a beneficial insect for your, for your um, ecosystem. So just got to keep in mind there that, you know, you really want to bring in everything. The only thing that you could probably be without if you wanted to really bird one is trying to attract mammals because most often squirrels and birds compete, you know, for the same food sources. And so you really don't want to attract both of those at the same time. Um, Corey, may I ask a question, please? Of course. Mm -hmm. um, in our backyard, we have uh, hanging from the oak tree one of those uh, mosquito attractor things mm -hmm. so that it attracts insects and they get caught in a thing and my husband empties it out right? because he's a total mosquito magnet. So we try <laughs> to reduce him from getting bit too much. Mm -hmm. Now, is that, if we have that thing back there, you know, I mean, we still have plenty of birds in the tree. So that's not a negative thing for the environment, is it? Um, I have to, I'd have to look. So the attractant, cause I mean, typically whenever you have a mosquito, most people think of citronella, but it's supposed to kind of spread it out. And then of course they have, um, so is it kind of like, is it similar to a fly trap where it's a bag where the mosquitoes go in, but they can't come back out? Um, you know, I, there's something makes me think it's, um, I don't know. I thought like a CO something like that i so think it's, it's that new one that they you know mm -hmm. recommend okay so basically what it is is because mosquitoes are attracted to um mosquitoes are attracted to the thing carbon we dioxide. exhale yes i can never which, remember which, if it's yeah so we, we, yeah. we exhale carbon mm -hmm. dioxide as well as our sweat you know, when you're moving around, your body, your sweat kind of just gases off carbon dioxide. And so that's why mosquitoes are attracted to you. So if you're ever like in a really calm situation or an area where you're very, you know, you're breathing into a mask or something, you're probably going to see you're not going to be attracted to as many um, insect, uh, mosquitoes. And so if you're attracted as basically CO2, um, you're really not going to have any issue with birds. Now, um, bees are also attracted to CO2. Um, but you know they they kind of use that as a as a warning that there's a big uh, another uh, ma large mammal or another kind of predator in the area because most often larger uh, mammals and we you know a lot of people give off a lot of things give off co2 um so that may be an issue if you end up having like a pollinator garden where you have a lot of bees they you could find they start getting attracted to that um, but as far as the birds i don't think it would be much of an issue but i would keep an eye out on that I mean, if you can kind of keep them into, keep that into a different section of your yard than where okay. you plan on building your uh, paradise garden. Thank you. Of course. All right. So continuing on, I want to give a big, um, really focus on this. If you can always choose a native Texas plant. Our environment is crazy. This week alone is, is an example of that. Texas, while we don't really have all the seasons, we have, cra we have crazy weather. And so if you can, 
you want to go with a Texas native plant. Not only are they going to be better suited for the environment, meaning they're going to consume less water, but birds and insects that have you know been here, their instincts are to go towards their native plants. Now, of course, they, they are also familiar and they've also adapted to very common plants um, that people put in their backyard, but they will more easily and readily go towards native plants because that's that's their instinct knows that's their environment you know um, and you can find all of your plant native plants by your zip code on the nationalwildlifefederation.org and they have a native plant finder it's pretty fun it's pretty it's a really cool resource because you can click on a plant and it will tell you what insects are attracted to that plant or what birds are attracted to. i think it's actually just insects um, and that way you can know if you know that you're, I really want to attract um, a certain type of songbird. I really want to attract mockingbirds and they really love this certain caterpillar. Well, now you should get a plant that will attract that caterpillar. And therefore I will have a better chance of attracting, um, of attracting the mockingbirds because just like you're aware or that you can become aware of, you know, what, what plants and what insects, the mockingbirds are aware of where their favorite foods are. You know, they have favorite, you know, each plant is like a little um, fast food restaurant for them, you know, uh, for, a, for, a mock, for a monarch, uh, Whataburger is probably a milkweed, you know, uh, which I, is actually fitting because they're both orange. But, uh, you know, it's, that, it's the idea is they have their preferences. They know what they, the birds know what they like as they, as they go around your community. And so if you can try to stick to native plants, things that are established and are used to being here, you're going to find it's going to be a lot better for your for your uh, your little uh, garden. We have a red yucca on our porch, and as of a couple of weeks ago, we still had a hummingbird that was getting from the flowers oh. there. Oh wow. Yeah, and then the little finches, the yellow finches, they go there and stick their little beak in the flowers and get them. <laughs> yep. the syrup, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, actually, yesterday I was in my garage and I saw just a little tiny titmouse, those little, little oh. um, round little birds. Uh, it looked like it was a it looked like it was a, either a baby or I, I wasn't, I'm not a huge birder. I've, I've, I really enjoyed the hobby, but I'm quite amateur when it comes to the knowledge of it um but i could have swore it looked like it had like a winter coat because it was very fluffy furry. and fuzzy yeah and furry um and i was surprised because i didn't think a, a bird that small would have still been around um yesterday the finch that was sitting on the back porch on the chair he was all fluffed up he was like a little like i was very afraid baby. they were going to be uh frozen when Me i was driving too. When I was driving home yesterday, I drove past an electrical, um, one of those large elect electricity plants where they have all the, where all the uh, stuff comes out of. And on one of the small buildings that didn't have any ice on it, because I'm guessing it was one part of where the motor generator batteries were, all of the birds were on that roof. I'm like, <laughs> it has to be a warm roof. And it was just tons of pigeons and, pigeons and crows. Yeah. Um, so continuing on. So we have food sources now. So this is what we're getting into the elements. And I do apologize. There's not very many pictures here. Um, this is just a, just a boring old book that you guys have to listen to. So we recommend three different food sources. Now you can obtain that or achieve this by just doing three bird feeders, or you can plant plants that are going to offer you seeds, berries, or nuts, or you can plant plants that will attract insect populations. You want to, if you can, choose varied sources. So if I were you, you have three options there, choose one of each, you know, um, seeds, berries, nuts, the et cetera could also be considered flowers for birds who enjoy, who, who feed on nectar. Um, but most often if your plant is flowering, then it'll produce some sort of seed or berry or nut. Um, and then, uh, you know, you have bird feeders and you, when you put these out in your garden and when we get later on to planning out your plan, you want to spread them out. You don't want to have all of your feeding in one location because most often than not birds are, you know, they might not lock, you know, one bird might not lock that other bird. You know, they might've gotten to a fight the other day and you don't want them to have to, you don't want them to arrive to a bird feeder and have three bird feeders in the area. And it's just a, it's a, it's a crazy mess of, um, of activity as well as it looks better if you have 
you know, if you have them separated out, you have one in this corner and one in that corner, it's almost like you'll be able to, you'll notice which birds go to which feeders and you can put in, you know, a variety of seeds, <clears throat> seeds and stuff like that. Um, Territorial too. Mm -hmm. the yes. Yes, they are. The, you'll see bir birds will fight all the time. Um, and so if you, you will benefit, if you can spread them out and let them kind of section themselves off, you know, there'll be people, you know, there'll be birds that are happy with each other and they will all flock to the same bird feeder. And you'll notice that as time goes on. Uh, and, you know, bird feeders are great there. And there's a lot of different types of bird feeders. You know, if you really wanted to attract, um, you know, there are bird feeders for birds, just like small finches, songbirds, they're ones a bit larger for things like a, a woodpecker, kind of like a suet block. Um, so you, you can really attract a lot of birds if you'd use bird feeders, especially because sometimes, you know, the plants that, um, that those, you know, that they prefer or, you know, are just hard to grow in your area or you, they, you know, they really love sunflower seeds, but you just don't have the, the, you know, the space to plant a sunflower. Well, you could still have a bird feeder that has sunflower and seeds in there. Um, and they'll really, it'll really help to attract those, those variety of birds. And then next, of course, you're going to need a water source. For a water source, one water source is fine. And whenever you choose a water source, you want to make sure that one, it's going to be suited for whatever wildlife that you to that you would like to attract, and it's easy to maintain. I think personally, it should be a 70-30 split, where 30% should be focused on the targeted wildlife, and 70% should be focused on cleaning and maintaining, because the birds are not going to put in the effort to scrub that bird bath or change out that water dish. You are, and so you want to make it easier. Your bird hide, your bear. Backyard paradise should not feel like a chore, and the water source is one way where you, it can definitely become a chore. Um, you can go with something as simple as a bird bath. Um, for bird baths, I highly recommend a two-part bird bath, where that's like a concrete stand and a concrete top. It doesn't have to be concrete, but just an example. And that way, you can kind of tilt tilt over the top without having to adjust the stand. Um, if you have one that's all all in one, just try to get one that's more lightweight, but weighted on the bottom. So that way it stays up still and stable, but whenever you try to tip it, it's not gonna be so easy or so hard for you. You can also just do a water dish. Um, if you have a faucet, you can have a, just put a water dish there and every now and then, um, and if you have a faucet near your backyard garden, that makes it even better because you could just set your water dish to kind of just drip, fill it up just a little bit and then have it drip. And they, the birds will be attracted to that because they'll look at it as if it's just a natural water flow. They'll look at it as like water flowing off leaves or part of a stream. Um, and they'll get, they'll get to have fun in that act of moving water. Um, additionally with a water dish, um, and with the bird bath, these are great because you can control when the water's there. You don't have to keep water in there all the time, especially in seasons when we have mosquitoes, because these things are just mosquito breeding pits. Um, so you definitely want to make sure that you are changing the water out at least, I would say, once a week. And in peak mosquito um, breeding season, I would change it out once a day or just you don't have to have a bird bath there all the time. You know, most people think you just fill a bird bath and that's it. Unless you have something that's moving the water out, you really don't want to have that stagnant water because eventually it's going to get bad for the bird as well. Um, if you're lucky enough, a natural stream and pond. Um, I don't know how many people who have natural streams and ponds here in Leander, but uh, if you do happen to have one in your backyard, definitely utilize that and build that into your wildlife plan. Um, but if you wanted one, you can always make a water garden or a kind of a man-made uh, uh, pond. Um, if you make a pond, it's always helpful to throw um, some sort of uh, uh, fish in there. Um, you could do koi. You could also do a goldfish, one of those larger goldfish, or you can do smaller goldfish and they will grow. Um, it should be quite big. And, and you want this because you want um, to keep the insect population under control, and to keep the, um, the plant population in your, in your pond under control as well. Um, I've seen some people who uh, take those big water fountains and they bury it. So they take the base off and they put that. So the base of the fountain is kind of like its own pond. And then it has water features that come out of it. Um, and it's just kind of, or you could have like a small waterfall as well. Of course, those are a lot more expensive, um, you know, of options. 
the water dish being the the easiest and least least expensive, but it just it depends on how you want to uh, how you want to spice up your backyard paradise. Next, we have cover for wildlife. So, your cover for wildlife does not mean a place for them to make their nest, although it can. Um, as you see in here, I have a bat box and a bird box. It's typically just supposed to be a, a place for them to get out of eyesight from predators, from other uh, competing birds, from you. Um, you know, they don't always want to be out in the open because instincts tell them that if you're out in the open, something can come up and snatch you. You know, they're always on the, uh, you know, small songbirds are always on the lookout for owls and hawks and other birds of prey that are going to take them out of the sky or take them out of, the, out of your backyard if they're just sitting on top of a fence the whole day. So you want to have some dense vegetation. If you, if it's impossible for you to have a dense, dense vegetation, choose a, a like an open top or an open uh, box bird box. So a bird house or a bat ha or bat box. This is something where you know it has a large cover, something that, pre that prevents a sight from above, but the sides are wide open. So it's just something they can go in and they can rest in without feeling that they're out in the open. Sometimes it helps if these are just one side is open so that they have that benefit that they're not having to constantly look both ways for predators, that they have that, that security of being able to back themselves in. Um, and then finally, you know, one pretty good way and you can make these every winter as you're kind of cutting back of your, um, your plants is you can collect your brush and kind of just loosely pile it up into a corner. So if you make your bird, uh, your bird paradise in like a corner of your yard, maybe where your fences meet, you can kind of pile some brush there and it will naturally form just a place where these birds can go in and hide if they need to. You can do the same thing with a rock pile. You don't wanna do um, small rocks. You need big rocks that are gonna provide holes for the birds to kind of walk to go into. Same for insects. That's another place, you know, a, a large brush pile or a rock pile also doubles as a food source because depending on how, you know, you're gonna have insects that are gonna come there to degrade that uh, loose brush. And you're gonna have insects that prefer that nice moist environment that you're gonna get in the rock pile. The second it rains, the inside of that rock pile is gonna be nice and moist and it's gonna stay that way until it's really dry throughout the summer. Um, Corey, mm -hmm. doesn't a loose brush or rock pile attract snakes too? And then are snakes a predator of birds? Yes, and yes. That is something you're going to be aware of. More, most often, um, you know, depending on your environment, you you can you'll probably be able to get away without without attracting snakes. But you're right, a loose brush or a rock pile is a is 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 a home for snakes, and that is something that um, you. That's, I guess that's another reason to make it really loose. So if you choose kind of um, thin twigs, something that you can see through, but that it's kind of hard to see through. Um, so if you chose, say you were cutting a crepe myrtle back, they have a lot of really thin uh, branches and you kind of bundle, you can bundle it up really nice and tight and make a nice tight bundle. But if you just kind of gather it around and crisscross, it's almost as if you're making like a thatch roof that's really, that you can see through. Um, and then you kind of just lay that onto the corner and that's going to create almost like a teepee, which will allow some blocking of the sun, allow some so sort of, um, um, uh, protection, but at the same time, not enough protection that a snake would be attracted to. However, a rock pile, yes, very much so. There is a chance that you're going to have a um, that you can attract snakes. So you should be very aware of that. I um, see. Koi, Thank you. Koi ponds too. We had a neighbor in Round Rock that had a koi pond, and he went out there to clean it or something, and there was a snake in the pond with a fish. <laughs> so, I hope it was not a water moccasin. I don't think it was a water moccasin. Rat yeah. snake. We were, it was, rat, rat snake. snakes were pretty, pretty prevalent back then. Mm -hmm. um, you can also look at snakes as beneficial uh, parts to your ecosystem. You know, there are a lot of, a lot of um, ground mammals that kind of, kind of can, can take our optim, op, opportunistic omnivores, meaning if they see bird eggs, they will eat bird eggs. Um, same thing goes for a snake. But if, you're, if you don't have any ground nesting birds, um, having a rat snake in your backyard, which Texas rat snakes are, you'd be surprised. You've probably seen them a lot more often than you think. Um, they are completely harmless. They really don't like to attack humans. Um, 
many people actually keep them as pets um, and they get I think they get up to be about four feet or so um, so not as big as say like a python but still fairly large I mean you're looking you're looking at least I mean, almost almost as tall as me um, and so uh, you know you have that you got to factor those those in um, and, and each year you're going to be doing um, you're going to be doing upkeep on your on your garden so if a snake does move in you it's more than easy just to kind of get him to move out by just removing his home you know if, if the loose brush pile is attracting the snake then just move it out of there and and you are good to go yes yeah, snakes do eat rats yes um in fact i have a rat i have a rat in my backyard right now that's making my grill its home and i'm hoping i was wishing that i had a snake um that's for sure so now we now move that on. happened to Oops. Bob last year. <laughs> a, a family of rats took over the grill. There you go. Just throw a snake in there, and that's all you got to do. No, I'm <laughs> I'm hoping my threw the grill away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my 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 thought right now. I have I'm waiting to be able to get rid of it. I'm kind of being nice because it's really cold, and I don't really want to have to kill the rat. Um, but I'm also hoping my dogs just take care of it, and I don't I just never see it again. Um, but eventually we'll have to completely spray down and get new grill covers, you know, new kind of cast iron tops as well. That I was, I was planning on changing it out anyway. So and maybe burn the whole thing, set the whole thing on fire and then just let it, let it burn down and it'd be like, okay, now it's good. All right. So um, now we move on room to raise your young. This is very important because you can make a backyard paradise that your birds just love to visit. But unless you want to see the full range of the circle of life, you really need to provide some sort of room for them to raise their young. Now, um, so you may have covered this in the cover. Mo like some, some birds have ground nests that they would make in a loose brush pile or in the small, in, underneath a, a shrub that you could consider to be dense vegetation. So you're going to be able to kind of double up on a lot of these sources. Same thing with this, you know, your tree could also be a source of food. So don't think that for each one of these elements, you've had to have a different plant. Of course you can, but you just need to be able to check this off saying, if I have a milkweed, that is both a room to raise the young for the insects, as well as food for the insects, as well as food for birds. So you could have more milkweeds. You could kind of spread it out without having to have as much of a variety. So we do recommend you have at least two different areas to raise your young and you want to separate these as much as possible. Um, you really want a, you know, a tree or a shrub, a bird nesting box. This is going to be something with a smaller hole, so not as easy for them to see out of. And probably, you know, depending on what, you know, you can find um, bird houses for your targeted wildlife or uh homes for your targeted wildlife. Same for caterpillar host plants. A lot of caterpillars, you know, the monarch is a big, um, a big example of that. They only raise their young on one plant. That's it. You know, you, you only see monarchs in milkweed plants and that's it. Um, there are different types of monarchs that use different types of plants, but they all, for the most part, they pick a plant and that's that. You know, they, those butterflies migrate. They know where they can find milkweeds, which is why the big thing that, you know, you hear a lot of cities have a big push to plant milkweeds. They, they give out milkweeds for free because without those milkweeds, the monarch populations just start to die off. You know, we've already seen a huge die off of these, of these very crucial pollinators. Um, and so if I were you, no matter what type of backyard paradise you guys build, have a milkweed plant. Because it's always, you know, it's really nice. And and monarch butterflies, you know, they you don't have to. They're food sources for for birds as well. You know, they they that's even as much as we want to, um, you know, protect them. You also just want to let the natural, you know, uh, circle of life, the natural uh, food chain go on in your backyard. You don't really want to have to uh, interfere too much in there. So if you make you plant milkweeds and you find that your monarchs are being all eaten, well, then you've provided a food source for those birds. Um, hey, Corey, can yes. I tell you something real quick? The craziest mm -hmm. thing happened last year. Scott and I bought a small birdhouse and we set it on the back patio with the intent to hang it in the oak tree. But would you believe before we could do that, a, a family occupied it and they laid their eggs and the eggs hatched. It was such a short period of time. <laughs> so then we're freaking out thinking, 
if we don't put it in the tree, we were afraid that a snake or something would get the babies. So we decided we would wait until the parents went out to hunt for the food. Mm -hmm. We would hang the, the birdhouse with the birds in it, in the tree, and then hope that mom and dad would find them. Mm -hmm. And it all worked out, but it was extremely stressful while we were trying to <laughs> relocate the babies while mom and dad were out hunting for food and that actually brings up a good thing um whenever you are gardening um you always want to wear gloves not only because you want to have that protection but our oil our hands have oils that a lot of animals smell um i don't know if you ever heard but uh my parents always told me when i was a kid we i grew up in the back of my yard we had a pond right behind our fence and with ponds, you have ducks. And I always loved, oh, I would pick up these duck, these duck eggs. Well, the ducks know the second you pick them up, they can smell, they can tell that their eggs have been, uh, have been touched and they just, they, that, that egg is done. They're not gonna care for it. They will most likely push it out and try to crack it. And so that's another reason why you wanna make sure that you're wearing gardening gloves whenever you touch anything um, that has to do with, um, like even like a bird box, like Tina said, I, you know, it worked out great in the end, but you have better, better chance of success if you make sure your impact on their lives is as little as possible. Because as much as these birds have adapted to live in close proximity with us, at the same time, they are also, um, how you want to say, they're still afraid of us. And they still are very wary of us and they do their best to try to avoid close contact unless they've really become adapted or they you start hand feeding these birds and they really become open to you but that's just that's just that one bird the other birds are still kind of very afraid of you so wearing gloves very helpful whenever you're doing gardening both on your hands because you don't want to get dirt in any cuts you don't want to get cut and having those cuts infected um, and then as well as just reducing your impact to your your scent on your garden all right. Um, now we last but not least, sustainable practices. So we have, I recommend you use two sustainable practices when you're constructing your backyard. And they're quite easy. I mean, you can say, you know, avoiding using pesticides is a sustainable practice. That as far, I mean, that's, you don't have to do anything to do, to gain that one. You just have to not do something. Um, but if you can't, you know, you have a lot of other stuff that you can use Limiting water use is, I would say, your biggest, the biggest goal. Because we're in Texas, you one, you, limiting water use is going to improve your water bill. So you're going to have less cost there. But two, just in general, Texas, you know, in the summer, you're going to have, you know, times where your city or your mud or whoever does your water may tell you, you can only water once a, day, once a week or try not to water at all. You know, we're on a water band, you can only hand water. So if you, um, and by limiting water use, there's, you can, you can factor that in. And I know it says you can do it through using, um, but if you choose native plants that are drought resistant, specifically drought resistant, because drought resistant plants mean that they don't need as much water. They can survive in low water environments. That's a way to reduce your water use. Additionally, maybe your loose brush pile becomes a compost pile after after a couple of years you know as you start to throw your dead all your dead plants and you throw it over there and whenever you um remulch every year you bring that extra and that excess mulch instead of spreading around everywhere you throw some of that onto your uh, your little pile and you start to make a compost pile and now before shelly says something snakes won't find their home in a compost pile it's too warm in there um, and there's, there's a lot, it's a lot of insects going on, but from a compost pile, you're going to have a lot of insects that birds will be able to pick at worms and other stuff that's going to break it down as well as, as years go on, you're going to be able to use that compost in your garden. So I recommend, um, especially you know, with the way people's backyards are that when you use compost, mix it with your mulch and put it on top, the re the nutrients in that compost are going to be watered down into the soil. If you use compost when you are planting, so you have that, you, you're filling up the hole of the plant, there's a good chance that when your plant, the plant's roots start to grow out, they're going to come into shock after they go from this really nutrient high environment from the compost into your natural soil, which most likely does not have very much nutrient. If you are in a subdivision that was built in the past 30 years, 
more often than not, you are, you know, the top of your ground is you have maybe a couple of feet of soil and then it's starting to get rock, you know, and all that soil, they just, they, it's cheap soil. They just took dirt from when they were digging around. It's not going to be the really nice soil they had before they started to dig up all this stuff and put all this rock in and, and pat it all down. So um, when you're planting, always try to use as much of the of the same soil that you dug out of the hole as you whenever you put it back in yes you it's not gonna be as much you, you can always supplement through fertilizer but you don't want to put your plants root system into shock as it starts to grow out and then it gets to an environment where it doesn't like itself and then it just basically it stops growing the the roots start to curl back in on itself it might even begin to choke itself as the roots started just chase that nutrients um, and so you just want to kind of um, keep in mind that. Uh, so reducing lawn and pavement, this is re, um, referring to zero scaping. So for your garden, um, instead of having kind of grasses or plants everywhere, you can have portions of it that are just rock where there's no, no plant, no water use or anything like that. Um, you can use a soaker hose. So instead of having to, uh, you know, just regularly water it, you basically implant this hose into your garden, you turn it on, it soaks up, it kind of, um, instead of spraying water out the side, it just, it leaks water all throughout the hose. And then, um, and then that, that's another way so that it just kind of, you don't have to turn it on as much. Um, and sometimes people just leave it on very low and it just, it's a constant source of water, but it's a very low source of water. Um, and then installing a rain garden. Now this is one that I was kind of confused on of exactly what is a rain garden. And what I'm assuming it is, is it is just a, basically a way, it's a, it's a garden that is, that is watered by rain, rain runoff. So if you have a, um, a gutter on your house and the gutters kind of it, the, the, where it comes out, uh, you could build a, a garden around that, <coughs> around where your gutter deposits the water. And that way you kind of, if you use native plants that are drought resistant, you know, in the wildlife, these plant, nobody's out there watering these plants. They're just getting the natural water from the ground. And typically wherever your gutter deposits its water, that's going to be a more moist soil than anywhere else in your yard. Cause that's, gonna, that's where water is more often being dumped. And so that's an option there. And then of course you have controlling invasive and exotic species using your native plants and removing existing invasive plants. So there are a lot of invasive plants in Texas that people don't realize are invasive plants. Um, one big uh, one that I have in mind is a china berry tree. So china berry trees, they grow really fast. They're, they look really nice. They provide a good amount of shade, but they are extremely proliferant, meaning they drop seeds in the thousands every year. Birds eat these seeds. They travel them around and a china berry tree can pop up almost anywhere and then it will it'll dump more seeds and it's just it kind of keeps growing it's a it's a terrible um it's just a vicious cycle many of our state parks are battling with china berry trees um that have been brought in by birds and they're kind of the big part of it is you know these trees are out in the middle of these of these parks in like the in the forest and the brush they're not easy to get to and because of that they have they could take you know if you don't notice a china berry tree is there for 10 years by that time there's three or four or five trees right there in the area with a whole lot more saplings and they are very they they are more suited for our environment than our native trees are meaning they can they're just they're 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 easier, easy, adaptable. They can, they over compete with our native plants and they begin pushing things out. And while they are food sources for animals, um, for wildlife, they're not the preferred food sources. So the preferred food sources are getting pushed out. So that's your sustainable practices there. Oops, sorry. So now we're going to get started. I'm going to walk you through what you guys should be doing for your own backyard plant. <laughs> and <clears throat> I'm, I'm actually running pretty good on time here. So I'll probably, when I'm done with this PowerPoint, I will probably pack or get myself nice and dressed up. And then I will uh, get on my phone and walk into the backyard and kind of start walking you guys through looking at how to build your, your wildlife garden. So 
first thing you're going to do is you're going to go into your backyard and you're going to draw an existing or rough sketch of what you have already. So try to do it to scale. So walk around, measure it as you can. Um, and then you're going to want to begin taking notes of, of what, you know, once you have a picture of it, take notes of things that you're aware of in your backyard. If you have dogs, do they prefer to, to you know, use the restroom in a certain area? Do they run in a circle? They've created a pathway so that there's always going to be action that time. Do they really prefer to run along the outside of the fence? You know, maybe then, maybe then your garden isn't on the outside of your fence. Maybe it's closer to your house. Um, do your neighbors grill on the other side of one fence? You know, noise that that um, that smell can really affect. Uh, you know, a bird doesn't want to have a bird box where they are constantly having to smell fried chicken or uh, grilled chicken. You know, um, and additionally, a big thing is: does your backyard flood after heavy rain? So there are certain areas that are going to puddle up because those are going to be these are be things you're going to try to avoid picking. You're trying to find that ideal area of where you want to. Uh, build your garden. Once you have all of the areas where you can't build it, the next thing you're going to want to look at is your sun. Most backyard paradise gardens require at least six to eight hours of sun. So that means a good, a good portion of sun. That's not just a morning sun. That's a morning to afternoon or a late morning to evening sun. And if you don't have a lot of sun, you just need to make sure that you find plants that are that are shade plants. There are a lot of plants that are shade plants, same for birds. There are a lot of birds that really prefer to stay in the shade, stay in these thick forests all the time. So don't feel like if you don't have a lot of sun, you can't make a wildlife garden. It's just, it's gonna be completely different on what choices you could choose from based on your sun. Um, you wanna also pick, um, you know, find where your sun goes as well as find where the animals, you know, where your birds are already going to, because it's going to be easier if you build up in an area that they're already familiar with, than if you try to shift them saying, well, I know that you really like this fence post, but what if you went to the other side of the fence and there's all these nice, beautiful plants over there? Some of them will probably flock to there, no problem, but some of them might say, no, I, I prefer my fence post. It's fine. It's been doing me fine for years. I don't want to change. Um, and take your time. There's no rush. Um, you know, it's February and we're dealing with late frosts right now anyways with this week. So really when it comes to, um, when it comes to planting, you're probably a couple of weeks to a month out before you should really start to, to plant. And that's plenty of time for you to get in, uh, into the rhythm of things, um, and get your wildlife plan, you know, worked out and then start to implement it. You want to research your plants. You know, the first thing you, we told, I told you to choose is you're picking the wildlife that you want to attract. When you pick that, the, Google is such a, an amazing resource. And the internet has so many birders that have made books. You have the Audubon societies, not only of our local area, but national Audubon societies. Um, you have a lot of universities um, that have put out resources. Texas Parks and Wildlife is also a really good resource for when it comes to figuring out what what birds, what uh, birds or insects or wildlife, what they prefer. So the first thing you want to do is you want to make sure um, if you have your bird in mind, what, what food source does it prefer? And check those off your list. Make sure that those are going to be on your food source. What water source does it prefer? Do you, does it, have you found people have more success with bird baths or water dishes or moving water that's more natural? And check those off. Um, Additionally, once you get that list of plants that you want to include, then you need to research those plants. How big are they going to get? Um, when does this uh, food source produce food? You know, sometimes you think, yeah, this is a great plant. Um, and, and, and it can be kind of uh, tricky because we are in a, a southern, more, you know, you could consider almost not tropical, but we're pretty close here in Texas. We have multiple growing seasons. We, um, nice humid air, especially if you, uh, you know, you go closer to the coast, that could cause that your food sources are a little bit different than what they're, they're expecting. So making sure if you have native plants, you're really not going to have this, this issue, but just making sure that your food sources line up for when these birds need them. Um, and like I said, how large can your plant get? You don't want to plant a bunch of plants really close together that are going to expand a lot. Your first year of your paradise garden, it may look pretty bleak. 
it may not look, you know, there might be a lot of open space, but you have to let that time for those plants to expand out, to grow their roots without having to compete with another plant so close. Do, are they perennials or are they annuals? Are you, you know, there are benefits for both annuals and perennials. Perennials, of course, yes, you're gonna get them year after year. They may even bloom multiple times in a year and um, you don't have to do as much work. But at the same time, annuals I've found are, you know, a lot of annual flowers are very vibrant. That color is gonna attract a lot of insects and birds. And yes, you might have to replant every year, but you're gonna have a lot more color in your wildlife garden, which might be very interesting. And as well, how does your plants fare in the winter? We don't have a very harsh winter, but we do have a couple of frost freezes, you know? And if the plant, if there's research that a plant just, it will not survive a frost, it might not be the best plant for you. Because we found, you know, in this past year, we've had a nice big freeze just a couple of years ago, we had another big snow. Um, you know, we had two snow days already. There were technically snow days. We've had two instances of ice um, this past, you know, within the past year. So, um, you know, really, how does it fare in this winter? And as, as well, how does it fare in the summer? Can it, re, can it survive our Texas heat without you having to water it to just to keep it alive? Um, I know my, some of my, uh, my habanero plant, when it comes to the summer, after this morning sun gets done with it, its plants or its leaves are so wilted, I have to go out there and water it, else it, will, it won't really recover very well and it will start to wilt more and more um, and the, the leaves will become kind of uh, uh, deformed. They'll start to shrink and, and shrivel a little bit. And when your leaves aren't completely flat and they're more shriveled, that's less surface area that's pointed towards the sun. It's gonna be reduced photosynthesis um, and the plant's just gonna have a harder time. So you want to be sure that your plant's going to be well suited for both the winter and the summer. And if you choose a native plant, you're going to have a lot easier of a job finding plants that are going to meet all of those criteria. Okay. Because more often, all of your native plants aren't going to have any issues when it comes with these criteria, except for the, you know, how large and does it come back each, each year. So once you've researched your plant, you have your targeted wildlife, you've researched your plants, you've drawn out your map. Now it's time to take your, take your map that you've drawn and we're gonna redraw it. You're gonna choose a, cause now you have all these notes on it. You have all the X's where it can't be. You've done your research. These are your research notes, but it's not your final proposal. You're gonna wanna use a graph paper and you're gonna wanna draw things to scale. This is very important because the more realistic you can be, the better prepared you're gonna be over the years of, of knowing how your garden's gonna be. So what you wanna do is when you are drawing your plants, after you've measured your backyard, and you don't have to measure it super efficiently, you can walk with your feet and just you know say each foot is, I typically say my feet are about 11 inches. So when I walk 10, 10 of my steps, I know that that's 10, 10, 10 feet and 11 inches or 10 feet and 10 inches. Um, so you can measure it and just get as close as you can. Um, and then you're gonna start by, first you're gonna start and you're gonna add your source of cover. So uh, say you choose a shrub. When you do your research for that shrub, find out how big that shrub's gonna get and put that size on your wildlife plant. That way you are already planning out for how big your plant's gonna get. Because if you say, okay, well, I can go to and get this boxwood from Home Depot and it's this big. So I'm gonna put that on my wildlife plant. Well, in a couple of years, your boxwood's gonna be a lot bigger than that. And you've already planned that you're gonna have plants closer together and that's gonna start to compete, you know, make a competing environment. Your first couple of years, you're just gonna, you know, wildlife plans are a, a law, it's a long-term investment. But once it pays off, and it usually pays off within two to three years, it's going to be beautiful. And it's going to be something that's going to not only be really fun to look at, but it's going to add value to your home as well. You know, I know whenever I was looking for a, a, a house, if I walked into a backyard that had a really nice garden, I love that. Because one, I want a garden. And so that just makes it easier for me. People love whenever you do the work for them. That's for sure. Um, and not, not only that, it's gonna be it's gonna be fun for your grandchildren and for your family when they come out that you can have you know things outdoors and you have this beautiful scenery to look at instead of like a boring old fence. You have you know this lush little garden. So, like I said, going back, 
get stop and get off topic, Corey. Make sure whenever you put on your wildlife plan, you put the size of the plant. Now, if you put it, if you plan on planting a tree, just know that yes, a tree is is going to create a lot of shade, and you really need to be a, you know be aware of that. But you can also plant plants underneath a tree's shade. You can plant, you know, that your when it comes to between a plant or a small plant, a shrub or whatever, and a tree, the tree is always going to win out when it comes to root com root co competition. So you don't need to worry about all these plants kind of choking out your plant your tree. Now that being said, you also need to make sure you don't plant anything too close to a young tree because they're still growing. Um, you want to give it a good probably a three to four foot birth um, when it comes to that. But there are a lot of plants that do. Um, that can thrive in the shade and would make a great, uh, great kind of ground cover underneath a tree. Um, so now once you have your cover and your places to raise your young, so this is your, your shrubs, your, 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 brush, your brush pile, your bird boxes, your trees, etc. Then you're going to start adding your food and water sources. Um, now I recommend you keep these kind of varied. So pick corners, or, uh, but not on the edge of the corner, maybe a little bit inside so that the there's still some plants on the outside. And then you have your food sources um, and then kind of put your water source someplace where you can, where you can view it. Because more often than not, you, you're gonna wanna, you know, you are building this backyard paradise for your enjoyment. And if you hide your water dish, if you hide your bird bath, you're gonna miss out on these really cute videos of these birds taking baths. And you don't wanna do that. Um, and then finally, once you have all this space all planned out, then you can see where you have open spaces so you can fill up with all these extra plants. Find plants that you enjoy, um, plants that are suitable, but that you that you just enjoy the look of, the feel of, you really like you really like this color. Um, once you've had all your your elements checked off, it's just a free for all, a free for all of what you can put in there. Um, and then, you know, if you don't want to add all the extra plants, maybe take that opportunity to get some of those really big river stones and zero scape the rest of your garden. Um, so instead of having mulch or anything like that, you just have rock that's less area that you have to water, um, as well as it's just less area where you're going to have to eventually de-weed or, or stop plants from growing. They're not really going to grow through that thick bed of river rock. There will be some that will try, but you can easily stop them by just plucking them out from underneath that. So, all right. Well, that's my presentation right now, but I still have some time, of course, and I'm more than happy. I'm going to go outside and show you guys kind of what my backyard looks like, and I'm, I'm going to walk you through the rough draft sketch. So I'll tell you guys, I know what my backyard, you know, where the sun is. I know where the, um, where my dogs like to go to the restroom, where my neighbor grills, where my other neighbors, uh, for whatever reason, burn brush pile in their backyard. And we're in the middle of a neighborhood, but every, this whole winter, they have gathered up all their leaves and all their small twigs and just lit it on fire every morning for their oh, wow. for them to go out in the backyard and and just stay warm um and it's always way too big of a fire and i'm like one of these days it is going to catch something but they've been lucky so far so um let me before i, I say we had uh hanging plants in our and so did my mom in round rock and birds would build nests in the hanging plant on mm -hmm. the back porch and yep. then we got to see a cardinal did that one year in May, and we got this, and we had like a tree line in our backyard um, that separated us from the field. And the mama bird would sit in the trees and speak, talk to their babies to fly across. So it was really <laughs> cute because this one little bird could not fly across. So he fell on this side of the fence, you know, he fell in the fence on the ground. And the mama is up there squawking at him, get up, get up. And we had <laughs> another Yorkie. And she we had to keep her indoors so that she wouldn't go after the baby bird. But he uh -huh. finally made it up in the tree. But it was hilarious. We spent a whole morning watching them. <laughs> Yeah, um, and that actually brings up a good point. And I've talked a lot about backyard, garden, backyard, garden, backyard, garden. Your garden doesn't have to be in the soil. I mean, not in the soil. It doesn't have to be on the ground. What Kathy said, you know, you can make a backyard paradise from hanging gardens, um, from, uh, from garden boxes. If you live in an apartment and you only have a balcony, 
you can still have a certified wildlife habitat on that balcony. So, you know, whenever I was talking about, you know, you want to keep it spread out, that's great and all, but at the same time, you can keep things really close and you can keep them in a nice, like concise little location. It's, you know, and, and many people will probably see the benefit of not having to get down their hands and knees if they have their wildlife garden is on their porch, you know, makes it a lot easier to, to deal with, um, as well as more often than not, and Shelly brought it, you know, very afraid of those snakes. You're not really going to see a lot of snakes that are going to move into your porch. They will move underneath your porch. Yes, no doubt about that. But they're not going to move into your hanging garden or your hanging plant. They're not going to move into your garden box. They want to be out there in, 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 the, in the ground because that's where they know they can find their food sources. And so you have that other benefit of if you do have a deck, if you do have a little um, – balcony if you do have a small little porch you can build a beautiful little garden on there as well so let me join the zoom call on my phone and i'm gonna step aside real quick so i have to go get my shoes and everything and then i'll walk you guys outside so i'm going to mute i'm gonna stop sharing actually actually before i do this let me exit out of here so this is the Texas, I'm gonna go through the links that I showed you guys earlier. This is the Texas A&M for the Texas insects. And you can see it has every type of insect that we have here in, in Texas. And you could just, butterflies are right here. And it's gonna show you all the butterflies that we have here in Texas. Let's, I'm gonna say, and, and caterpillars and moths. So I'm just gonna say, look at this polyphemus moth. And it should take me to, so this is the lunar moth. So it's showing you all the types of lunar moths. So you can attract beautiful insects like this. I mean, Shelly, I know you don't like bugs, but I don't know how you cannot say that this is not a beautiful insect. I'm waiting for her to chat. <laughs> um, and I love, I think moths are amazing because if you attract both moths and butterflies, that means you get beautiful sights during the day and during the night. <laughs> Um, and so that's the insect uh, website and that'll help as well. So if you know that your birds really love a certain type of caterpillar, but you can't really find as much information on it, you're going to find it here. So this is, this is essentially, this is a resource for researchers to find common Texas insects. And so, uh, Shelly, does this scare you that this many insects are common here in Texas? Not even keep yes. scrolling. Yes. Scrolling. I, I don't like bugs. <laughs> <laughs> all these, all this stuff. Um, Sorry, you're yeah. giving me nightmares. <laughs> Can we have a talk where you don't talk about snakes? Uh, no, because it's <laughs> Texas. You can't, you can't not talk about the outdoors and and, and snakes. So, uh, next up, we have the. Uh, this is the Travis Audubon um, page where I had, uh, and this is specifically, actually, this is local birding links. Um, so this is going to give you information. This would be a, a big resources for all of what they have. So they have recent bird sightings. Um, you're going to have information on some of the places you can go, your bird checklists of, of Texas. They're right here, of Texas Parks and Wildlife. Um, and then you have local birding organizations, as well as if you really enjoy birding, you have information on some of the festivals that you can go to year round. And next up, this is your um, native plant finder. So I can click on native plants here and it, it does it by zip code. I already have my zip code at the top and I can change it to say, um, so let's do 78641. So really, if you have anything in the Hill Country, whether you're Round Rock, Texas, or Georgetown, Leander, Cedar Park, the zip code's not really going to make too much of a difference because it's all going to be the same native plants. Um, but you can see here flowers and grasses, trees and shrubs, um, and you can click on here. They have a lot of pictures, so not all of them have pictures though. Um, and let's see, there are 15 pages of plants. So I can click here, let's click on uh, sunflower. Here we go. So I click on the sunflower and it will eventually go to the website. Come on. Okay, let's click on goldenrod. All right, we'll come back to that once it uh, decides that it wants to actually load up the page. There we go. So 
here it gives you some information of the goldenrod is the drape based species and it's going to give you specific native species so you know, it always have different uh, types and it's going to show you all of the insects so it just shows you your their top 15 so um it, we have mo lots of moths and butterflies you might not find as much more than just the name here um in fact, this just has no common name and it just has the scientific names. Um, but it's gonna give you a good resource of, of things that you can expect. Um, I don't even see where this, oh, do you guys see this? That's a caterpillar. Do you see the caterpillar right there? It's camouflaged itself by attaching parts of the flower to its body. So it's just, so you probably would look at this as just, why is that little twig or why is that flower moving? And, that, and there you go. And so that's just some, you know, you'd be surprised what the beautiful insects. <laughs> ah, yes, uh, it says you can find, can I find milkweed? Yeah. So let's go back here. It should be pretty easy. Nope, it's not gonna be on this page. Let's just search milkweed right here at the top this, this website is going very slow there it is so you have butterfly milkweed and then you have the other ones this is the one you, one you want to do so you have milkweed but it, commonly also known as butterfly weed and you have lots of different types of milkweed that we have here we have a texas milkweed you have broadleaf butterfly uh green anter i don't know something this is a milkweed but it's definitely not the kind of milkweed that we expect here in texas um i don't not quite sure exactly um which one we have here in texas orange milkweed uh that is the butterfly weed so that's the one where you if you're looking for the ones that's really going to attract the monarchs it's going to be the butterfly weed um, but maybe, but they, they will, they're, um, you know, they're attracted to other ones as well. And, uh, if I can get back to where I was just a second ago, there we go. Um, lots of other, you have the monarch butterfly, you have the very commonly mis, uh, misidentified monarch, um, mimic. So the queen butterfly mimics a monarch butterfly. Do y'all know why the queen butterfly mimics a monarch butterfly? So monarch butterflies are, um, and most orange butterflies, are poisonous to birds, or rather, they're they are their bodies. They are they're not they're not good. You know, you you eat a bird eats a monarch butterfly, and it's going to become sick. Some birds have have good digestive systems. They have the bacteria to be able to do that. But a queen butterfly adapted to a monarch's coloring system because they said, well, if they aren't getting eaten because of their color, well, then I want to be that color. And so over the years, they adapted and they changed their color and their, you know, they basically mutations grew and the ones that looked like monarchs survived. And as they continue to mutate and get closer and closer to monarchs, then they, and you get these, this beautiful, still beautiful, a bird, but it's just, or a butterfly, it's just not a monarch. And you have um, some other really nice insects and, and uh, be very careful if you try to attract asps or uh, hairy, hairy caterpillars. They're great, but you should ne don't try to touch them because they are not fun. Um, they, uh, you, they have a lot of antihistamines that cause you to itch. They can sting or bite as well. They are, it's just not fun. You never want, I've had a, an asp uh, drop on me from a tree and land on my neck and I screamed from that pain of getting stung by that thing and it is not, not fun um, so you can attract them they are food for certain animals um, just be very careful whenever you are doing your gardening um, and then of course you get really cool ones like this this is not really uh, I wouldn't say this is not so hairy but at the same time I probably wouldn't uh, pick up one of these caterpillars either. They have a lot of, you know, they get these colors, these little spikes, I'm sure are going to have something that's going to make you itch or um, a little tiny poison or a venom that's going to, you know, make you not have a fun time. Um, so, all right, well, I am 
on my phone now. So if you guys just give me about five minutes, I'll walk into my icy backyard, talk you got talk through how to make your rough draft, and then we will uh, call it a day. So I'll be right back. Can everyone hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. I Excellent. Can, hear you. can you guys see my? Um, I actually probably need to. Let's see if I can share. Oh, shoot! I want to share my screen so that way everyone it's right there in front. So give me one moment. I gotta turn myself off of my other computer. I see your puppy, Kathy. <laughs> yeah, she's a uh, 14-year-old Yorkie. Her name's oh. Daisy. Daisy's beautiful. No. Ooh, he looks about the right size for my puppy. <laughs> There's Corey. Freezing. Oh. Yeah, so we have our back. It's my backyard. Nice and big. Lots of options here. And you can see, even I did, and this was last year, uh, we replaced our stairs. And so I used my old stair wood to create kind of our sort of edge garden. Um, but everything has long since since died and 
I need to actually this year I'm going to be digging all this up, replacing all of the um, the dirt again and planting some more seeds to see how we go. But we usually have some pretty good success when it comes to potted plants. But talking about your, do we have our backyard? So first thing I would do, I basically walk around and start measuring. I'm not going to do that right now, but try to get a, a nice um, sketch of what what it looks like. I also want to look at. So I have my my neighbor over here. He grills, and typically the wind comes and blows into our our yard. So I wouldn't really want to make anything on this side of fence our yard. Additionally, this is where my dogs love to go to the restroom. If I were to build a garden over here, it probably wouldn't be that great because my dogs would be all through it because they just would be loving because they would, it just they prefer to go. Now they really do not, for whatever reason, go anywhere over here. But unfortunately, I can't, it wouldn't be a great time for me to make or a great place for me to make a garden down here because my whole backyard along my um, fence line floods whenever there's a heavy rain. So if I were to build a garden there and it has a heavy rain, I could end up drowning out a lot of my uh, plants. And then it's going to take a lot longer for them to uh, kind of, def not defrost, but dry out. Especially since it's underneath the tree, which means it's going to have a lot of shade and not very much sun. So my best option is going to be over here. Now, additionally... My son's my son kind of comes from this side and goes all the way over here. So this is the only section of my yard that gets a full sun. So if I wanted to use my garden um, and have nice big full sun plants, then this is going to be the area where I'm going to have to where I'm going to start. But down there, and you can kind of see my yard kind of slants. Uh, that's that's some that's a somewhere uh, flooding area. And I don't really want to pack it back here. Why, why would I not really want to have it around here in this corner? Anybody know? Can't, can't see it. Can't. Snakes. Yes, exactly. What's the point <laughs> of making a garden where you enjoy it? I don't have any windows that go over here. So I really want to, for my backyard, my best option is going to be one that I build something right along here. I have a nice deposit for my gutter so that I can, I can have a portion of it be a rain garden or at least be a portion of it be um, watered through the rain. I can have, I'll be able to see it through my window as well as our guest room will be able to see it. And it's, it's close over here to this other water source so I can have a water uh, a dish. My dogs are coming out so can, maybe one of them will trip on the ice. Um, and so this will be my this will be your ideal location when it comes. But now I still have to take the time, go through, figure out what if, if any birds like to come over here. Which I can tell you right now, not very many birds like to come into my backyard. Um, they used to come a lot when I had my other two trees over here, but we were in the process of removing those two trees to plant another one. And so, um, which is good though. If if birds don't come a lot. They don't have a preferred area to to visit. That just means that whenever you put something into your backyard, that's going to be an ex that, that's just an opportunity for them to be attracted to it. They're going to want to go to that that new place because they didn't have any preferences beforehand. Whew. All right. Well, do y'all have any other questions? Um, I I uh, would you guys pref like. If you want, I know we, um, the next, next month is going to be, is March and, you know, ho hopefully be a lot warmer so that we can actually get out and, and, um, and have a, a class on, on, you know, proper gardening techniques, uh, either with the Hill Country Gardeners or our own um, maintenance supervisor, who is a, uh, who is a, a, was a forester and knows a lot about proper planting techniques. Um, but at the same time, would you guys also prefer if I had kind of like a workshop where I walk you through step by step of actually building a, um, you know, the process of doing a, a wildlife plan where you can bring your own wildlife plans to, to ask questions on and we can just work through them together? 
or is this something that you guys are confident that you think you can you can handle on your own and of course you can always ask questions and send me your plans and, and we can do it otherwise i don't know if you but we're more than happy to have a a whole um class we can, on we can that's, show that's we could all are. we could all um that's a good idea too, Corey, what you're doing, but we could show or take pictures or take a little video of our own. Bob is, Bob is just like you. Mm -hmm. he, he mapped it out when we, because we bought a new home. So the yard only yep. didn't have anything. And he did the whole landscape idea. And every once in a while he refreshes it and adds more plants or whatnot. But um, yeah, just how yeah. to improve it. So I think that I think uh, like if you giving us more ideas on what would be good right. in our yards. I think um, I like that. I think we sh will have. So of course we'll have our. I think we'll do both ideas. Um, we'll be able to. We'll do a kind of like a show and tell workshop where people can bring their own. Um, if you have it ready, great. If you don't, you still just need some more ideas. Um, and we'll schedule the show and tell early into March. That way it's not a month ahead of time. And then you're just, you're too slow when it, or you're, you're, you're having to rush to, you know, to get everything planned, you know, and in order to hit that, that, uh, the good planting season. And then when it gets closer to the planting season, then that is when we will have the, um, the proper planting techniques with, uh, with our other, uh, with either Rob or the Hill Country Bloomers or the Leander Garden Club, um, and that way we get both of those. And, and I will, in the meantime, I will actually put together my own plan targeted at specific insects or specific birds. And that way I can show you guys, here's the native plants I chose for this type of bird. I'll choose a common bird, um, probably a songbird, maybe even, maybe just a mockingbird, um, something to attract a mockingbird because it is so a Texas animal or a Texas bird. So you, know, you really want to show it some love. But um, yeah. Uh, do you think, so think in that, March we would be doing it live, like at the library, or we still do it virtual? Um, the gardening would probably be live, uh, in person. Um, the because it'll be outdoors. Uh, we'll likely go to uh, the there's an educator garden at the the, um, the Hill Country Ministers right there behind. Uh, it's kind of red rock, just near, enchanted rock, right? Yeah. No, no, not that, not, not, not that far out. Um, no, enchanted rock, oh, enchanted uh, not rock. enchanted rock, uh, the gardening area by Red Barn. Ah, uh, yes. Um, it's, it's close to there, but yes. Uh, well, we'll go to an educator garden. It'll be in person. And that's because you, when you, whenever we do gardening techniques, it really helps to be there, um, to be able to watch in person and, and, you know, kind of even uh, follow along as well if, they, if there's opportunities for you guys to do it on your own as well. Um, but then for the wildlife plan, we'll probably do that one virtual because um, I could, it, it just, it will work a lot easier. You can share your screen on your computer or you can hold the picture or you guys can submit your, uh, your program, your plans ahead of time. And then that way I will just show them all off from my computer and I have, um, we can draw on them and, and um, we can all draw on them together. There's a way um, you can actually use the annotation feature here in Zoom so that if I had like a blank page, we could all draw and make our own map ourselves. Um, so that's what we're going to do. So um, do you all have any other last minute questions before I head out? No. I think we're good. We're good. Well, everyone, please stay safe. Um, it, it may not be raining today, but the ice is going nowhere. Um, I've heard on the news that the ice isn't going to go anywhere until when, until Tuesday. So please be safe. Um, you know, if you drive on the road, drive slow. There's no rush to get anywhere. Um, if you're walking out of your yard, out of your house, make sure your, uh, your steps are not iced over. Um, you can see, and I'll show you my, my whole deck is ice. So I've been walking very carefully. The last thing I wanted to do was that I was going to walk and it was just going to, I was going to slip and fall and you guys are going to hear a lot of bad words come out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already, I've already been struggling not to say anything just based on the cold, but, um, but yeah. It, it's well, crunchy. Um, 
Yeah, it's very crunchy, yes. Well, if you guys ever have any issues, if you have questions about your wildlife plan between now and our next program, please feel free to reach out. Um, I'm more than happy to help. Um, if you don't Ander, if you happen to live in a different, uh, different town, um, whether that's Cedar Park or Georgetown, Round Rock, Pflugerville, um, you might want to check with your local uh, public works department or your local parks department and see if they have any sort of like plant buyback or plant rebate program. Quite often, um, a lot of these towns, and I know Pflugerville um, was where I used to work, was the big one that did it where their water, um, their public works department would rebate you up to 50% of your plant if you planted and had a wildlife plan using um, using native plants because it reduces their water usage and it made it easier. You're breaking up, Corey. You're frozen now. You're frozen in time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go inside and warm up. Have cocoa. Yeah. I'm breaking up. Yeah, and you're frozen in picture. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. All right. See you next time. Thank you, Corey. Bye, Tina, Shelly, Emma, Esmeralda. Bye, everybody. Janice. Thank you, Corey.